and the jazz clubs, or women's rights, or the Gulf War, or oil wars. It's real simple. You put your loafers on, you put your black socks on, you get in your car, you have your briefcase, you say hi to your neighbors, he mows his lawn just like you do, and things keep moving along in the same direction they always have been. That's why marijuana laws exist. There are, in my opinion, people in government, at all levels of government, who know that it's not a winnable war, and yet they continue to pursue it. Acceptance of drug use is simply not an option for this administration. Often we go to debates and it's a police officer debating us. Okay, the police are supposed to enforce the laws. They should not be arguing for or against laws. That's not their job. Well, what is their job? Is it to enforce laws that exist on the books or to determine the policy of the laws that are made? The way to justify the policy is to create a lot of fear and then spend a lot of money combating it. Quite frankly, if you took the using population of all the other illegal drugs combined and you eliminated cannabis from that equation, there wouldn't be a big enough drug problem in either this country or the United States to justify the massive expenditures uh, that go towards fighting the war. The amazing thing is the small amount of enforcement that is necessary. $400 million is spent annually in Canada arresting and prosecuting marijuana crimes. The total budget in Canada for all drugs is $500 million. That means four-fifths of the drug budget goes towards arresting and prosecuting marijuana users, leaving one-fifth for crack, heroin, coke, crystal meth, the date rape drug, whatever. The drug enforcement industry is big business. It's self-perpetuating. It relies on taxpayer dollars. And so it's an endless battle that the DEA doesn't win. They participate in. It's like doing a big budget movie, you know. You get $30 million to do a movie, and then the movie comes out and it doesn't make any money. But someone made $30 million. Every once in a while, they'll show a guy, you know, posing beside a big bunch of marijuana, you know, this is the, the DEA money at work. It'd be like asking loggers about saving trees, you know what I mean? This is where their, their mainstay of their cash flow comes from. The campaign will continue uh, until every uh, available known uh, plot of marijuana has been eradicated. We've got to live with it, doing the best job we can. Even if it's a bad job, we're all carrying a pretty impossible load, Miss Gibson. There are many, many police officers, however, who believe that it ought to be legalized, regulated, and controlled. They see the hypocrisy between our existing laws relating to alcohol and marijuana in their day-to-day -day life, shift after shift after shift, and they get it. But they don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to lose that promotion to sergeant or the assignment to detectives. They want to be a chief someday, and they don't want to piss off the people in power. Judges, lawyers, prosecutors, defense lawyers, uh, prison guards, uh, there's all of those people in the criminal justice industry. Are their interests being protected? Well, in a sense, yes, they are. Defense bar, similarly, we make money. The more things they prohibit, the more money we make. Sorry I'm late, Kent. I was delayed in court. You still have large numbers of people being busted for simple possession. If you look at the stats, in terms of drug offenses, the largest group are still simple possession of marijuana. Every time you blow a marijuana cigarette, you take a chance on blowing your future. Oh, come on, Pop. All my friends smoke pot. They're not criminals. Only because they haven't been caught yet. If you do drugs, you will be caught. And when you're caught, you will be punished. 750,000 Americans every year are charged with pot possession. That's nearly a million people, and whether you go to jail or not, your, your life is in serious trouble. And that number of annual arrests for marijuana now rivals the number of arrests for murder, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault combined. You will never get over a conviction. A conviction will track you every day for the rest of your life. For instance, do you remember that guy that used to smoke but didn't inhale? Former President Bill Clinton. This is not a big issue with me. I never even had a drink of whiskey till I was 22. Now, if Mr. Clinton handed me that marijuana cigarette when he was standing in a circle with us, it wouldn't matter whether he had inhaled or not. He would have become a dope dealer, wouldn't he? Just like all those other people that went to jail. Never to be an attorney, much less the president of the United States. 
But the marijuana laws protect us. They make our lives safer. They send us the correct moral message. That's how 19 out of 21 nations have gone down the drain before us. Internal decay. The breakdown of moral, ethical, and religious principles. If you've been caught, a young person in the U.S., with so much as one marijuana cigarette, you can't get a loan or grant from the government to go to college. If you've been convicted of murdering somebody or raping someone, no problem. You go right down, they'll give you the loan. I guess the message is it's okay to rape and murder and pillage, just don't smoke a joint afterwards. First thing that John Ashcroft did after 911 sent out a strike force to take down the LA Cannabis Buyers Co op. That really helped uh, national security a great deal. And what else helps national security? Taking down top criminal targets. In 2003, the US government put aside money to do just that. $25 million for the head of Osama bin Laden, $15 million each for the whereabouts of Uday and Kusei Hussein, Saddam's sons, and a $12 million budget to go after one of the most dangerous men of all, this man. Can you tell us what exactly you were charged with? I was charged with conspiring to sell paraphernalia. Operation Pipe Dreams was, was a, a brainstorm of Attorney General John Ashcroft. The internet has been illegally utilized to sell these illegal products and to facilitate large illegal businesses operating in the open. A sting operation that busted people for selling paraphernalia to a particular county in Pennsylvania where they were willing to prosecute. Because there's two states, Pennsylvania and Iowa, void where prohibited. Well, it was prohibited to send it to Pennsylvania in Iowa. A man like yourself that is, you know, an established actor, comedian, you're not a criminal, like why do you think they targeted you? Well, because our movies were number one rentals <laughs> in America. What our, what our movies did was really show the hypocrisy of the pot laws. In fact, when I went to jail, they had it in the transcript that our movies have influenced children for 30 years and will continue to do so forever. Therefore, I should go to jail. <laughs> You got to remember, they were going into Iraq, and they needed some diversion as far as headlines go. And they equated the billion-dollar paraphernalia business with aiding terrorists. This was a legitimate company paying taxes. I was just the face on the bone. They charged me. I had nothing to do with the company. I never shipped anything to anybody. It wasn't even his company. He just loaned his name to it. 51 people were arrested under Operation Pipe Dreams. Only one person, Tommy Chong, went to jail. But if I didn't plead, they threatened my son and my wife. Tommy stands up and volunteers to go to jail, says, yeah, okay, that's my paraphernalia. You leave my wife and kid alone. He's protecting his family. What kind of force was used on the day you were arrested? There is over 20 SWAT team people, visors, uh, automatic weapons, helicopters overhead. They had news trucks, Fox news trucks outside. They had the media on the ready. This was, it was a photo op for everybody. They asked, you know, do I have any uh, drugs? And I said, yeah, I got pot, you know, and they wanted to know where it was, so I told them. They said, well, it's not really a drug bust. I said, well, then what the are you doing in my house, you know? Then they said, it's about bongs. We're bringing down all the bong companies in America. And with Tommy safely behind bars for nine months, the United States drug war reset its sights, this time across borders. In downtown Vancouver, just outside the U.S. consulate, a bunch of people had gotten together and were having a rally for this guy named Mark Emery. He had evidently been selling seeds, marijuana seeds, to the wrong people. Let me tell you, the DEA wants me because I am very good at what I do. Well, obviously, I'm the most dangerous man alive. Like, really. Like, no wonder I'm facing life imprisonment without parole uh, for something that no one's ever gone to jail for here in Canada. No one's ever gone to jail for seeds, not even for a day. Mark and two of his employees are facing life in prison in the United States. Not Canada, the United States for selling marijuana seeds over the Internet. The Vancouver police came in here with a, a warrant for an extradition, but uh, we were taken then to... North Fraser Correctional Center. Correctional Center of the year 2002. <laughs> Beautiful facility. Mark Emery has 
gotten in the face of the United States. The U.S. sees Mark Emery uh, as a major political threat to its anti-cannabis agenda. In a press release from Karen Tandy, head of the DEA, she said that this is not only the end of uh, marijuana trafficking, but it's a blow to the marijuana legalization movement. I gave just under four million dollars away over 11 years to Supreme Court challenges, ballot initiatives, political parties, you know, drug addiction clinics. Well, if you're the DEA, who the hell do you think you're going to go after first and foremost and as viciously as you can do it? I think they even admitted it themselves when on the day of the raid, the DEA announced you know, so he's a, a legalizer. We're shutting down the, one of the biggest legalizers. Uh, it won't, the legalization movement won't have a pot of money to draw from. Ha, 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 ha. Mark Emery has never gone to America and sold a seed. He does it all from here by mail order. And it's akin to Canadians ordering, you know, a machine gun from somewhere in America. It's against the law. And if we receive it here in Canada, they come and arrest us for receiving the machine gun. They don't go to America and say to Colt, hi, we're arresting you because you sent a machine gun to someone in Canada. No one's been sentenced to any time in jail in the history of Canada in 35 years. We've had this law. Two people, me and Ian Hunter and Victoria, were fined. There's all sorts of seed businesses still open. Mark's the only one out of about 50 uh, retail cannabis seed businesses in Canada that's been charged. Mark has been paying the Canadian federal government taxes on income he has made from selling seeds. The government relied on the existence of these internet seed sellers so that patients who had qualified for medical marijuana exemptions who were bugging them for seed were being directed to these internet seeds and Mark Emery specifically in some cases is the place to get their seed. It puts Canada and our government in a very difficult position because they've either got to hand over a Canadian citizen to a foreign government for activities that were entirely done in Canada for which our own government, our own police are not willing to charge him. If the Canadian authorities who rubber stamp this shit think that what I've done is so bad then charge me. I should be tried by a jury of my peers. I'm not about to be tried by my peers at all. I'm about to be tried by foreigners. At 4.20, a time synonymous with smoking marijuana, everyone lit up. And for those who didn't have marijuana to light up, again the police were close by, and again they didn't seem to care. One officer mentioned she was bothered by the smell of the smoke. It was kind of confusing. How could we be sending Mark Emery to prison for life in the United States if even our own police aren't finding it worth their while to bust people smoking it right in front of them? That's not the only thing that's confusing. The marijuana that's consumed in the United States, how much comes from Canada? I don't know much about Canada. I don't either. Maybe. 20%? I'll go with 35. 35%? And a quarter. 50%. 50? 50%. I would say about 60%. 60%? 70%. Yeah, 70, 80%. At least 80% of it. Ooh. I don't think it's all that much. Most of it is here. We're getting the drugs are saying, oh, you know, BC bud. This was when some of the people in Canada were trying to get um, marijuana legalized. John Walters went up there and said, what you're talking about is passing a law that will allow you to export poison to my country. When we talk about poison, exporting poison, what do we export to Canada? Cigarettes. 430,000 people die in the United States every year from ingesting cigarettes. Five million around the world. So who's exporting the poison here? Of the six million people who benefit from treatment and need it in the United States today, 60% are dependent on marijuana. Lies, lies, lies. You know, they invited me. I'm sorry. I wasn't sure who invited him and uh, why he came here yet again. He's been here before. He needs to shake his head. So how about him shutting down the cocaine that's coming across the board? How about him shutting down the guns? Sometimes you, you feel like you've stepped into Alice in, in Wonderland. You've gone through the looking glass. In fact, more Colombians die from U.S. tobacco than Americans die from Colombian coca products. So what's the drug war really about? Because if you don't want American tobacco in your country, America will go to war in a trade sense with your country. You have Canada engaged in cannabis policy reform and taxing and regulating cannabis, and all the scare stories haven't come true. 
Uh, you have an awfully hard time 